Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name is John Pearson, and I'm a Kevin Harrington Student Ambassador. And on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students here at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics in St. Anselm College, I'd like to thank you for being with us for tonight's event. And I would also like to take a moment to thank President Stephen DeSalvo, our college's president, for being with us this evening as well. Thank you, Dr. DeSalvo. The Institute's mission is to engage, educate, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and to strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we begin tonight's program, I would just like to remind you to please turn off any cell phones or other devices that make noise. And following our panelists' remarks, we'll have a brief question and answer period, so please direct your questions to the microphones in the auditorium. Purple Strategies is a bipartisan public affairs and strategic communications firm that was founded to address the need for a balanced and bipartisan approach to corporate communications, reputation management, and issue advocacy under a single one-stop shop for the private sector. Purple Strategies has locations in Washington, D.C., Houston, Texas, Chicago, Illinois, and recently they launched a new Boston office to serve the New England region. Tonight. Purple Strategies will release their new purple poll for the 2014 midterm and 2016 presidential election cycles, and presenting the purple poll will be Mr. Doug Usher. Mr. Usher is the research director of Purple Insights, Purple Strategies Research and Polling Division, and he will explain the purple poll's methodology. Mr. Usher brings over a decade of public opinion research to Purple Strategies, and his background includes opinion research about voter consumer and elite decision-making audiences. Also, at, during Doug's presentation is Alex Castellanos and Steve McMahon, both of whom are the co-founders of Purple Strategies. And we are also joined by Jim Demers and Pat Griffin, who are the managing partners of Purple Strategies New England. Our panelists bring a depth of knowledge from across the political spectrum and their accomplishments and their backgrounds, reflecting the vision of Purple Strategies. Finally, our moderator this evening is Mr. James Pindell from WMUR-TV. Mr. Pendell authors WMUR's Political Scoop and provides on-air political analysis for WMUR-TV. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our panelists from Purple Strategies and Mr. James Pendell. So I want to start a little bit just to set, set the framework of what we're doing here. We've got Republicans and Democrats on the same stage all getting together for Purple. Uh, and probably some green too, I think, probably is it. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, so cynical. Never. So cynical. Hey, it's bipartisan. We can agree on that. Um, for, at the beginning, though, uh, Steve, can you just tell us a little bit about what you guys are trying to accomplish and the, the roots of this firm? Well, the roots of the firm are, I mean, you know, everything that you ever needed to know you learned in elementary school, right? So the roots of the firm are. Uh, a, uh, basically a couple of guys, Alex and myself, who kicked around politics for a really long time. I worked on the blue side for Democrats, did political campaigns. Alex worked on the red side for Republicans. And at some point, you know, we ran into each other so often that we said, hey, why don't we get together and do something that, that hasn't really been done in Washington, form a red-blue firm, and we'll, and we'll call it Purple Strategies. And so we did that about six years ago. And Purple Strategies is basically a campaign firm. Um, we don't do political campaigns for candidates anymore. We do campaigns for brands and for industries that are in challenging environments or, or trying to manage risk or trying to figure out how to, um, how to position themselves so that they can do their business in a way that they, that they um, feel is socially responsible and um, consistent with their business interests. So we get, we get clients from all over the spectrum, from those who are in crisis like BP, to those who are trying to just navigate um, and tell their story a little bit to opinion leaders and others, folks like McDonald's or Coca-Cola or other companies like that, that, um, that really just want to be understood a little bit better. The firm itself has um, everything that you could ever want in a, in a, or need in a campaign, including advertising and uh, research capability, P a PR capability, digital, lobbying and grassroots. And now we've got two of the brightest minds and best political talents in New England, in James, De James Demers and Pat Griffith. And, and uh, we're just very, very excited to be here because there's so much, so much that happens here in terms of business and politics and political activity. What we major in really is, 
managing and shaping political and public opinion so that a candidate can be successful in moving voters to their, to their campaign or a company can be successful in navigating uh, the pressures that, that impact their license to operate. So we're going to talk tonight about, about political brands, political candidates, people that you've known for a long time. Some of them are in the race. Some of them may be in the race. Some of them may not be in the race. Um, they each come to the table with different strengths and weaknesses, partly their name and their history and their heritage and their story that people understand pretty well. There are some blank slates that, that are like a blank slate brand that are yet to be filled in, that have an opportunity, if they're filled in correctly, to be very successful. And then there's some really well-known and well-established brands, some of which are, are pretty strong right now and some of which actually um, are legacy brands like the Bush brand that have a different and unique set of challenges from a Clinton brand or, or even a Mitt Romney brand that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight. So we're delighted to be here. Thank you very much for coming. And that's kind of the short story of Purple Strategies. Thanks, Steve. And with that, Doug, why don't you get us, uh, walk us through this poll that just came out today. Thanks a lot. And one thing I'm learning today is that being a pollster means you don't get to have a chair. So I'll be <laughs> standing <laughs> you lord over us, though. the whole time and lord over everybody. And for those of you who are here for the marijuana presentation, that was right there this afternoon. but there are snacks in the bed. <laughs> you just want to nip that in the bud. <laughs> All right. There we go. Um, so I will explain the methodology, but I will not do it for too long because I don't want to bore you to tears. Um, we've, we've been doing the Purple Poll for almost three years now, uh, looking almost exclusively at swing states. We did it through the 2012 election, just to toot our own horn. We were ranked as one of the five most accurate polls uh, in 2012. Um, and we are starting again right now, looking at 2014. Thought we'd start in New Hampshire, not a bad place. Um, and we do an interesting combination of uh, interactive voice response, derisively known as robocalls, but also use online, um, uh, online interviews as well to reach those who don't have cell phones. And uh, we, we think we've got the right mix going right now between some of the older methods and some of the newer methods uh, that help to get a good picture of the electorate. And, and to date, our results have borne themselves out. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the state. Uh, I can assure you that um, there's no shortage of polls that are going to be coming out. Um, and all predictions in this deck are going to be true or your money back. Um, <laughs> so let's start and take a look at the candidates. Um, every 26, 2016 Democratic candidate that we looked at is viewed unfavorably by general election voters. Um, I will. Uh, 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 see the future that says the next slide, which is every Republican candidate is seen unfavorably by general election voters as well. We're in a very sour environment. It is a rough time to be a candidate running for office. Um, and the notion that there's some uh, 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 cavalry out there that's going to come in or some incredibly <coughs> popular person that's going to land off the moon into either of these races and become uh, a beloved figure is extremely unlikely, and that's more a commentary on the state of politics right now as it is the state uh, on the state of the electorate. Um, looking at Hillary Clinton, uh, it's pretty dramatic that she's negative on favorability, 45-46, but among Democratic primary voters, she is beloved. And these are, and as we'll see in the vote in a few slides, these are historic numbers for a Democratic primary candidate at any stage of the race in New Hampshire. Not three years out, not two years out, not one year out, et cetera. It's just, in, it's incredible how strong her support is right now among primary voters. Elizabeth Warren, frankly disliked in New Hampshire, um, but primary voters have a good feeling about her. Note among independents, they are negative on her as well as on Hillary Clinton, though not dramatically for Clinton. Joe Biden, you know, similarly uh, negative view overall. Uh, independents also, but positive view from the Republican, from the, uh, from, from the Democratic primary voters. So that's all worse. That, that is terrible news for Democrats until you look at Republicans. Um, <laughs> and every single Republican candidate we looked at also looked at unfavorably. Um, I think one thing to note is just how high Chris Christie's unfavorable numbers are right now, already at 42. Um, but then when you take a look at GOP primary voters, it's interesting to contrast these numbers where nobody is nearly as beloved as either Elizabeth Warren or Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side. And again, taking a look at the unfavorable numbers, the fact that Chris Christie already has a third of the primary electorate 
in New Hampshire with a negative view of him. As you know, during these campaigns, that number does not go down. It can only go in one direction. And so I, I'd say it's problematic at this point, especially considering this, that what's going on with him is really just beginning. Um, you'll also notice, though, that there's a unique piece of information, uh, which is that Rand Paul is the only candidate on either side to have a overall favorable view among independents in the state. And we see a couple of nuggets of Rand Paul. If you compare that to Ted Cruz, which you know down in Washington we had said, oh, they're following the same path, it's pretty clear that the path that Rand Paul, to date anyway, has laid out is more appealing than what Ted Cruz has laid out uh, to this point. Taking a look at the, uh, at the field as a whole, looking both at the Democratic electorate and the Republican primary electorate, 68% in a New Hampshire primary is just, it's unbelievable. Um, Hillary Clinton is obviously has an incredibly strong reputation among Democrats, but she's by far, she's far from a perfect candidate by any means. And just, you know, four years ago, or I guess eight years ago at this point, she lost a primary, she won the primary, but lost an election. And the fact that she has consolidated Democratic support to this extent not only um, shows what is historic momentum at this point, but also the difficulty for a credible candidate to join the race. And the question you always ask when you think about who might join a race is, number one, um, are they credible? And number two, is there any advantage they get by running? And in this case, when you look at numbers like this, it's hard to think of a credible person who will run with the idea that they're taking on the Clintons who on either side of the aisle recognize that they have an incredibly strong machine um, and angering them. And the idea that it's gonna raise your profile, it may, uh, but it really, I think it would take a unique person right now, and things may change over time, to step out. By contrast, we tested Mitt Romney on the Republican side, uh, and Mitt Romney is winning. Uh, and everyone here is gonna have- time. To <laughs> <laughs> Folks here will have, have more to say about that. Um, but the fact is, there still is a residual goodwill towards him, whether this is a real number or just a ghost number on, for, you know, you take out Mitt Romney, maybe everyone moves to undecided, you put in another candidate and they replace him. Um, but the fact is, he does lead in a race right now. Uh, Rand Paul, again, another nugget of his good news, he's second. and. Again, the fact that he is tied with Christie or ahead of him and ahead of Jeb Bush at this stage says a lot about, in a, in a Republican primary electorate, it says a lot about where the party is right now and also how he's positioned himself. We also tested Ted Cruz and, and Bobby Jindal who are at lower levels right now. Are there other candidates we could have tested? Yes, and we will test them um, in other polls. <coughs> Looking at the general election, two things I think are important to note. First is that um, Hillary Clinton's popularity and strength in the Democratic primary translates to a slight but you know negligible lead by any measure at this point, leading Bush 46-42 and leading uh, Christie 44-42. And for those Republicans who want to get Elizabeth Warren into the race, um, she actually loses right now to uh, both Bush and to Christie. Um, the second thing to note is the huge presence of the gender gap here. And you've got a 27 point gender gap when Clinton faces Bush and an equal 27 point gender gap uh, when Clinton faces Christie. So there's no question that Republicans can win with a gender gap. There always is a gender gap. Um, but the narrative that has been set coming out of the last election, a narrative that continues to be set among Republicans vis-a-vis -vis women voters is going to start to be locked in again if that doesn't break, at least to some extent. So we also made a little news with this poll with the New Hampshire Senate race that came out tied. <coughs> so sitting Senator Jean Shaheen is losing to uh, candidate. Uh, she's not uh, losing yet, Doug. Sorry, she's tied. She's tied. <laughs> she's tied. <laughs> That's just inside, Doug. That's all that is. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, Doug, come on. I know, exactly. I've been doing this all day. Um, so she's tied with Scott Brown, which you could say is a moral loss at this point. Um, 
<laughs> but she is having, a, the point is that she faces a tough, a tough re-election um, if a candidate like Scott Brown were to get in the race. Um, again, I wouldn't say this is a prediction about the race, except to say that this is going to make Republicans much more interested in it and also expand the field. Uh, it's clear that a race that was not on anyone's radar screen even probably six or eight weeks ago is now on everybody's radar screen, and not just because of this poll, but there are some other polls that showed a tight race. And after all of you have seen one and a half to two million dollars worth of ads attacking her, that does take a toll on anybody. Again, there's still a gender gap. This gender gap is less pronounced than it is in the presidential race. The presidential race, we saw a 27 point gender gap. Here we see um, a 19 point gender gap. And just one final piece of note from the, to note from the polling, and I'm sure the panelists are going to have a lot to, to say on this, but it's 92 all over again. It's still jobs. That, that there's been some recovery in the numbers is not <coughs> filtering down to voters. They still care primarily about the economy and jobs. It's more important than health care and Obamacare. That doesn't mean that health care and Obamacare should not be an issue in this race, because it's very important both as a rallying uh, issue, um, as well as one that has incredible economic implications and helps to, to bring about a contrast between the two parties. Um, but the fact is, if you're not talking about jobs in this election, uh, there's a serious problem with your candidacy. Um, and minimum wage. It's lower down the priority. It's not to say people don't support minimum wage, and you know all the data indicate that they do. It's just that it's not an issue priority the same way other issues are. So I'll leave it at that for the data. I won't go on anymore. Um, but let's turn it over to you to ask some questions. We can get started. Thank you. Let's get started. Um, I want to take some of those data, but I want to open it up to a broader topic first, uh, since we are in New Hampshire at the Institute of Politics. Um, we can start this way, keep going back and forth, just kind of jump in uh, and just keep this conversation. Oh, oh we will. Don't worry. Don't that worry. happens. <laughs> um, to start with you, Alex, is New Hampshire purple? Is New Hampshire purple? Um, New Hampshire is a little redder than it was, and it was blue, so I'd say it's purple. Uh, the country, I think, as a whole, uh, we're looking at this coming year as a little bit of a repeat of 2010. I think the mess we've seen in Washington is making is uh, is making it a year where Americans are going to demand change in outsiders, and I think Republicans are better positioned there. So I think that's driving the country, I think, in a redder direction. And, and when you see a Senate race like this, and we know that by, you know, if Scott Brown were to get in, he'd get a couple of million dollars worth of negative ads on his head, and, and it would look a little tougher. I think Shaheen is an underestimated uh, campaigner and tough and, uh, and would run a good race. But I think, yes, New Hampshire is, uh, I think the Democrats are exhausted in their political rationale. And I think we've seen that in Washington. The thing Democrats love most, health care, they couldn't make it work. And Republicans are not exhausted in their rationale. They don't have one. But they have the potential. <laughs> they have the potential of a rationale. So I guess this is pretty close to as jump ball as we've seen in American politics. We're waiting for the next generation of candidates. On the other hand, Steve, uh, I put words in your mouth. You can have you can do that well enough yourself. But you know, uh, Democrats have won the presidency here every single four years except for one time since 1992. That's right. It looks pretty blue to me. In one well, sense, right? It's it, I think it's it is mostly a purple state because anybody can win. It, it has trended blue, and there's been an advantage to the blue side, just as I think if you look at the Electoral College today, you know, almost any Democrat starting a presidential campaign under the current scenario starts with 242 electoral votes, which makes it difficult for the Republican because they have to basically run the field, which was Mitt Romney's problem. You couldn't basically run the table and, and get to 270. Um, but uh, it, it, is, it is mostly a purple state. And the fact that this race is in play, I think, indicates that 
you know, Gene Shaheen, who was a popular governor here and has been a popular senator and didn't look vulnerable a short time ago, <coughs> is getting caught up a little bit, I think, in the, in the Obamacare rollout. And as those, as those problems correct themselves, and if there's some evidence that they've begun to and they're accelerating the correction, um, I think Gene Shaheen's problems start to look a little bit more manageable. And I believe that to the degree that Republicans harp on and make this a referendum on what has been a referendum the last two or three cycles, Obamacare. And you know, in 2012, it was a referendum on Obamacare, and Obamacare won. So if, and if you look at these numbers, there's every bit, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of data that suggests that people are tired of debating Obamacare. They're tired of the Republicans voting 40 times to repeal it. They're ready to move forward. They're ready to talk about jobs and the economy and how we're going to make America more competitive and how we're going to create opportunity for the middle class, which I think the president figured out. And that's why his State of the Union was so much about trying to bring up the middle. I thought he was very careful not to do the democratic populist where it sounds like you're angry at people for being successful um, sometimes. He didn't do that at all. And that's the right tone. I think the content and the politics of it are good for Democrats. So I think the more Democrats talk about jobs and the economy and the more Republicans talk about Obamacare, the better things look for Democrats. I thought he talked about all those things in the economy because he didn't want to talk about the thing nobody liked. <laughs> <laughs> well. Of course, that's why we're that's why we're purple. We got, the red, <laughs> we got the blue. You know, Pat. The last weekend of the presidential election in 2012, you have Barack Obama with the big dog in Concord. I think 15, 20,000 people show up. Election Eve, you've got Mitt Romney, the Verizon Center. This was a hotly contested right. purple state, though. At the end of the day, right? right. It was, and I think that the <clears throat> one of the things we have to remember about New Hampshire that's so interesting is that New Hampshire is a place where the largest population of the voter segment is unenrolled. Uh, this is very important in our primary, too. You can pull the ballot you want in the New Hampshire primary, or independents can vote, let's put it that way. And it's much more like America than Iowa or South Carolina when it comes especially to Republicans. The, the, the Iowa thing doesn't sell here. New Hampshire is not a <coughs> Christian conservative or evangelical state. It is not South Carolina that has a very similar profile. So here, when you come here, you've got to hold your base, and you've got to win some enough independence uh, in a crowded field to get a ticket out of New Hampshire, as we like to say. I, I will say this, and Steve has hit on a, a, a good point. And by the way, Steve McMahon is my partner and one of the smartest guys I know. How can a guy as smart as him <laughs> yeah, he always be so wrong drop, on right? every <laughs> single thing he believes? <laughs> Um, I, it, Steve makes a good point. The president gave a good speech the other night. I don't think I've seen this president give a bad speech. Clinton gave great speeches. Reagan gave ga great speeches. The problem we had is that there was an incredible deficit in that speech the other night, small d, where the president talked about his accomplishments and then reminded all of us of the shortfalls. The rich were getting richer. The poor are poorer. The middle class continues to sink. So the real question is, I think the president did some indictment of his own success after five going on six years in the job. And I also think that it sets this thing up for a long discussion about not is Barack Obama a good guy, or is the Democrat brand better than the Republican brand? The question is, as Yogi Berra would say, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? And at the end of the day, I think American voters are going to decide. I think the reason the Senate race is hot in New Hampshire and the reason no one expected it to be for Senator Sheen is because the natives are restless. And I think that in New Hampshire, as Jim well knows, we change teams a lot in the legislature. It's a blue year, and then we throw them all out, and it's a red year. And we throw them all out, and it's a blue year. So New Hampshire has the ability, I think, James, to be as purple as it would like to be. And those shades will vary. And I bet they vary again, vary again in, the next, uh, in the next election. Well, I want to, that's a really interesting point you made about Barack Obama's speech style. Alex, do you have any uh, analogies you would like to? Say anything that comes to mind. We're at a Catholic college, okay? I think, I think he's a very talented speaker. Okay, very good. And it reminds me of pizza. Oh, even, there it is. Even okay. the worst pizza you ever ate is, is still excellent. So you're going to be safer here and not on TV. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Understand, understand perfectly well. You know, let's just imagine, Jim, that you were a 
Uh, the Democratic nominee for Congress in 1986. You know, just to throw out a number. Don't remind me. Uh, <laughs> this state has definitely changed. It has, uh, yeah. No it, doubt about it. What has driven that? Why have Democrats been able to make this such a competitive state? Well, Is first, it Republicans first, or Democrats? first, let me say, from sitting up here, I'm beginning to realize just how purple it is. First, John, very nice touch. John wore his purple tie tonight. But he's been outdone by Justin with the most unbelievable purple socks wow. over here. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, first, I have to agree with Pat on one thing he said, and that is we have seen ping pong politics in New Hampshire, that this is a purple state. One year, everything seems to go Democratic. It swings Republicans. It swings back and forth. Um, Seems like a pretty good place for a purple strategies office, huh? Hey, what a thought. What, what's most amazing is we have a legislature that acted quite different from Congress and really did act purple because we have a Democratic House and a Republican Senate and they did a budget ahead of time with not one vote against the budget in the Senate and the Democrats unanimously supported the budget and they actually did a purple solution. And so when I look at these numbers, particularly you know, the Gene Shaheen, Scott Brown numbers, I think the biggest issue that weighs in on this is how tired and disgusted people are with Washington in general. They're frustrated that nothing gets done, and so there is this feeling of expressing the sour mood by saying, we really dislike everybody in Washington. And so it's reflected in this poll, and I would expect that if Scott Brown gets into it, he will then have to explain that he also has been part of Washington. And that's a difficult thing to talk about today because I don't think there's anybody in this room that really isn't frustrated watching Congress do nothing. Um, you know, we were talking in the other room earlier, and some of us who are old enough um, remember the days when Tip O'Neill was the speaker and Bob Michael was a Republican leader, and they would go to dinner together and do a deal and come back and do what's right for the country. And today, you can't even see the Democratic leader and the Republican leader having dinner together. It's a big no-no. And that, that's, I think, the real frustration that we see in these polls with voters, that they really want Washington to change itself. It's broken. Um, so I think if Scott Brown gets into this race, He's going to feel the same pressure that Gene Shaheen is that people are expressing their frustration with the way Washington's uh, operating or not operating, and that's reflected in the sour mood. Um, so I guess that's a little bit off of the topic other than to say, so this is a very purple state. Um, we've become a state that's in play every presidential cycle now. It used to be in New Hampshire. Candidates came here in February for the primary and we never saw them again afterwards because this wasn't a place where either side had tightly contested races. Now, New Hampshire with its four electoral votes, which isn't much, can be the decider in those tight races. And so we truly have become purple all the way down, you know, down the ticket. And I think this is another one of those elections that the mood is so sour, it just depends who decides they're coming out to vote. Um, if the Democrats are depressed and stay home, it could be a good Republican year. There's two things I think that the poll doesn't reflect, though. We also know this is a really strong coattail state, that the person at the top of the ticket can have a rippling effect all the way down the ballot. John Lynch, when he was running and getting 67% of the vote, swept a lot of people, and there were people who said, I have no idea who I just voted for for state rep, but I voted Democrats all the way down the ballot. And if you look at the way this race is shaping up, um, there is no Republican right now, serious Republican, getting into the governor's race. If Maggie Hassan, who is very popular in the polls show, she does have strong positive numbers, if she pulls the kind of numbers that John Lynch did, that's going to have a rippling effect all the way down the ballot and could be the margin of victory uh, for a lot of Democrats. The other thing I think that this poll um, reflects is that for the past month, we've all seen it, that Americans for Prosperity has spent a million and a half dollars with one 
hard-hitting attack ad on Gene Shaheen. And that has virtually gone unanswered. Um, $100,000 was spent in ads to defend Gene Shaheen, a million and a half, and that, that does take its toll. Um, but we really haven't seen a race start yet. I mean, she doesn't have an opponent. She has a few Republicans, but she doesn't have the opponent that the Republicans are trying to get into the race, and that's Scott Brown. So it all changes the day that Scott Brown gets in, if he does. And that ad didn't even defend Gene Shaheen and attack Scott Brown. That's so true. It wasn't even her, hitting her issue. That's issue. true. And we'll find out more about that. But uh, I want to take one moment of personal privilege to ask a question not on this, but on something you just addressed. There were going to be four events tonight. This, of course, is the most important event. <laughs> there was going to be an event at Dartmouth that involved Dinesh D'Souza. I think he's uh, not able to make it tonight. Um, there is uh, Andrew Hemingway is announcing he's running for governor, as you mentioned, the governor's race. And I want to talk about that. And of course, the fourth being that my Indiana Hoosiers are playing basketball and, I, and, I'm, and I'm here. But that's fine. Um, uh, let's talk about the governor's race. What is the argument for someone like Andrew Hemingway to get in this race? Uh, we historically know that whenever a first-term governor wants a second term, they're likely to get it. Right. But, you know, she passed the budget 24-0 in the state right. Senate with Republicans controlling it. What's the argument? Can I win a car on this one? <laughs> <laughs> You're the branding expert. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about branding a little bit because that's where I think that we have uh, some problems. There's ideology and then there's practicality. And we, we talk a lot in the advertising business about the dog that won't eat the dog food. The advertising is great. The television is great. The packaging is great. Uh, but the bottom line is the dog just doesn't like the way it tastes. So at the end of the day, unless you change the recipe for the dog food, you're not going to sell much. You can run all the ads you want to and say whatever you want about the other dog food. But at the end of the day, you've got to have a product that someone's going to eat. But we as a party, my party, the Republican Party, has some real challenges as a party. We're having a bit of a family discussion about who we are and what we want to be and which side of the party is going to wrestle control of the party. For right now, for right now in the Democratic Party, I will give the party credit. Hillary Clinton was supposed to be the nominee in 2008. She was the franchise candidate. She was, she was going to be president, or definitely the nominee. And she wasn't. An un a completely obscure, very, very young African-American senator won that race from nowhere and redefined the party. The party of Barack Obama is very different than the party of Bill Clinton, the Democratic Party. So the question we have to ask this is, while the Republicans engage in this food fight, whether it's on the governor's race here in New Hampshire or nationally, what winds up happening on both sides? What does the future of the Democratic Party look like? Does it look more like, like uh, Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama? Uh, same with the Republican side. We have to ask ourselves in terms of the governor's race here, is if we don't learn from what happens in the previous race, and we keep trying to do it again, James, we're going to... We're, we're doomed to repeat ourselves, as the old line goes. As far as Andrew Hemingway goes, he is a very conservative guy in a state that is not very conservative. So what I would suggest is that those are the facts. Those aren't Pat Griffin's opinions. I mean, the bottom line is the proof of the pudding Ask is in the eating. Ask Yeah, Ask Lamontagne, who is a, a terrific guy and a great guy and a good friend. I, I, I think that this is not about the person. It's not even about the party. It's about the fact that the state has moved in a certain direction, like it or not, and Republicans have two choices. We either abide by the rules of division and subtraction, as Rance Priebus would say, or multiplication and addition. And that is you've got to build a bigger party. You've got to invite more people in. If Republicans make mad lists of people we are mad at or we don't want included, in our party, we will not win an election. My fear on the governor's race here is that Maggie Hassan is, uh, appears to be, and, and there are certain things I would take issue with the governor on, ideologically, but she's very popular, and I think a strident conservative candidate, the reality is, is probably gonna have a tough time. No matter how strong their ideology, how bright they are, it's gonna be a very, very tough slog. So at the end of the day, um, the, the electorate right now, I'm not sure, is going to eat that dog food. <laughs> you know, Jim, again, one more thing on the governor's race. I want to open up to the, the presidential race and, and, and Scott Brown. You know, this, this guy, Andrew Hemingway, um, not, that, not that guy, but <laughs> Andrew Hemingway, 
Uh, name IDs at eight percent. Our uh, our station gave away a poll just a, a few a few minutes ago. Uh, Maggie Hassan still not particularly well known. Um, she's got a state of the state next uh, next week. Is this a next campaign speech? What does she need to do for branding here? What, what, does, she, what does she need to say? Well, if she sees what our poll has for results, I would say jobs, jobs, and jobs. That that is the overriding issue that's on people's minds. There are a lot of Republicans that think it's all about Obamacare and repeal Obamacare is going to win the election. And the poll really shows that that's not the, the overriding issue on people's minds. Now, there may be people that are troubled by Obamacare, but it's the economy that's on people's minds here. And so the candidates that talk about what the voters want, and jobs is it, and has a plan and talks about how we're going to grow uh, the economy of the state is the candidate that's going to win. So if she was asking my advice, I'd say that's the critical issue to talk about. You know, when you look at the numbers on uh, health care and Obamacare, which is in the teens and jobs is up significantly, um, it makes you realize, too, that while there's a lot of questions and concern about Obamacare in the state, um, I'm not convinced the voters want the whole thing repealed. That when um, you know, some of the Republican presidential candidates talk about that's their number one mission, um, I think the average voter says, maybe if you've got problems with it, let's figure out how we fix it. And I thought that was part of the message that Barack Obama delivered very well in the State of the Union, that don't just be critical. And that was a message to both sides. But really, if you're going to be critical, tell us what your alternative is. Because to say I'm just against something and not be willing to say, here's my alternative to it, is an empty discussion for the voters. And so I think you know, it, it really does come down to, though, it's still the economy. Even though we only have 5% unemployment in the state, the voters in the state have a feeling of there's still some insecurity. That you might have a job, but they're not sure what's going to happen a year from now. They could lose that job. So that's the kind of security people are looking for. And I think all of our um, elected leaders should be focusing that on the most because that's where the voters are. It's, right. it's, more, I, it's more economic anxiety than it might be jobs. Can I add one thing in terms of what to look for in the state of the state then? If, if, if uh, I think a Democratic governor can learn something from a Democratic president. One of the few things that the, a chief executive officer can do is not only do your job, uh, make the nuts and bolts work and that kind of thing, but you're the chief inspirer for the country if you're a president. If you're the governor, it's your job to say, hey, we're all going to go over here. There's something better. It's like being the chief executive of a company. It's the job, it's the one job in the company that doesn't have a manual, doesn't have a set of instructions. You get to say, you know, this is who we are. This is who we want to be, and I know how we can get there. If right now when times are so sour, what people hunger for the most, what all of us do is, tell me when the sun's going to come up. Tell me where it's going to get better. Tell me what we have to do to, to lift our eyes over the horizon a little bit and get to a better place. Oh, there are a lot of things I did not like about the President's uh, State of the Union speech. But I thought he did a, a pretty good job at pivoting from the these people are poor because these people are successful rhetoric to we can all do better. And that's what I'd, I would, I think, is her opportunity next week. I thought, too, his conclusion was one of the most powerful conclusions to a State of I'm the still Union crying. I've ever seen. Because <laughs> I'm crying he, too. He, he really did focus on a young individual who I think yeah. any of us who watched that felt the pain that he's going through. But he was able to weave it into a message that you said, and that is, if this guy can get up every morning and put up the fight and do things, why can't we in Washington? Why can't we put the politics aside and get some things done? And I really thought from a message standpoint, that was one of the strongest conclusions I've ever seen to a speech. Steve? Like pizza. <laughs> <laughs> when Hillary Clinton saw your poll this morning, what was she thinking? Holy Everyone psychoanalyzes her, so you might as well, too. Who put this well, crap in my inbox? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, she was asking more questions on mythology. But, you know, you can, yeah. 
um, I, I, you know, there's a certain amount of here we go again that, that I'm sure she's feeling. And she's not just feeling it because of this poll. You know, she picks up the newspaper and, or the Politico and she reads about the secret meetings that are being held and the campaign that is basically being stood up without her direction and not under her supervision. She reads about how she's the inevitable nominee, about how she's at 68 in New Hampshire, about how she can't be defeated. And, and it starts to sound quite a bit like 2006, 2007. And you know, she, um, she actually lived through that play and she saw how that play ended. And I actually am one of those people who's not sure that she wants to go through that again. I mean, I think the, I think the table is set for her to run, to run the table, to be the nominee, probably to be the president. But it's not gonna be without a, a great deal of personal hardship, personal pain, even if it goes well. It's, it's, it's absolutely, anybody who's done a presidential campaign, and I'm sure there are a number of people in this room who have, it is absolutely exhausting. And it takes every ounce of energy and spirit that you have. You don't get a minute off, you don't get a minute down. And it's not even like it was, you know, the last campaign I did like that was in 2004. And the difference between 2004 and 2012 or 2016 is remarkable because, because there's not a second that you're not under a microscope, microscope. So any normal human being, I think, probably <clears throat> would be reluctant to, to do it to begin with. Anybody who's been through it um, would probably be even more reluctant. Anybody who's got a, got a, a reputation that she's built um, for herself after being one of the most successful secretaries of state. The legacy and the way she'll be remembered now. You know, she got up off of the mat and she did something for her country. She served in an administration of, of her opponent. I mean, she's done some remarkable things. And I just don't know, you know, if she has the energy or the spirit to kind of go through it again. So I think every time, you know, you see something like this, if you're Hillary Clinton, you think there's only one way to go from here. It's probably not up because she's so far up right now. Right. And, um, and you know, I wouldn't blame her at all if she decided not to do it, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if she decided not to do it. And I think probably that's what she thought this morning is, oh my God, here we go again. Well, James, James, let me, let me yeah. just, I just yeah. want to jump in because Steve makes a good point. I, I, here's the problem, and those of us who live in New Hampshire, and I see a lot of faces in the crowd from both sides, who've been involved in lots of presidential campaigns and local races. When you're at 68%, two years, or more before a presidential primary, the ability to hold even the 28% where Hillary Clinton was, as you point out, about this time, the last time, or the first time she ran for president. It's very, very hard, as Steve points out, to hold that number. I mean, you think about it. Hillary Clinton is running in this thing. She, like Scott Brown, is not a candidate, number one. She's very likely to be one. Number two, the Clinton brand is both a blessing and a curse. The Bush brand is a blessing and a curse. What happens now is that Hillary Clinton's highest moment must be before she starts being even more defined. You talk about Americans for Prosperity and others running ads against her. Um, the Clintons come with some baggage, like most candidates. And so the drama and the baggage that goes with being a Clinton uh, is not going to be an easy thing to sustain. That gravity pulls you down when other people get there. And so the question I have, and we've been asking this a couple of times today, I made the point at the beginning, Hillary Clinton is not Barack Obama. She did step up and embrace him. That was a tough, bitter campaign. Jim, I agree with that. Uh, Steve, rather. Uh, but I do think that what happens is once she's been in the cabinet and served the president well, at some point, Hillary Clinton's going to have to make a very important decision, which is, if this president's numbers continue to stay at 40, 45, 44, 46, 42 percent, wherever they bounce around, and Obamacare is a gift that's going to continue to keep on giving to Republicans. That's a fact. Um, I, I know that most people don't want to repeal it, maybe, but they don't like it. And, and at the end of the day, as the mandates kick in, and as the realities, the costs of this thing kick in, it is very, very likely Republicans will have much to talk about with regard to Obamacare. Here's Hillary Clinton's choice. Do I put my arms around an unpopular president and say, that's my guy. I was his secretary of state. 
I'm going to go forward, forward, forward. That's where he wants to take us. Or do I say, you know, I like the president, and it was an honor to serve him, but you know, I can read, and I can add, and the numbers aren't in the right place. It's a very tough place for Senator Clinton to be, Secretary Clinton to be right now, and we got a long way before the voting starts. But l l let's just contrast 2008 to where we are today. Because Pat, Thank you. That was the question I was going to ask. <laughs> I, I was reading it off your paper. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so Pat mentioned that two years before uh, the 08 election, Hillary Clinton in New Hampshire was at 28%. She's 40 points higher than that today. John Edwards was in second place here at 20%. My candidate, when I decided to support him, was at 4%. Alan came on early. I think there were probably days we looked at that poll and said, what the heck are we doing? Um, but look what happened. Um, and Barack Obama ended up winning. But so Hillary Clinton is in, as, as Doug said earlier, unprecedented territory. And the difference from 08 and today is that when Hillary Clinton got into that race, so did everybody else. If you look at what Hillary Clinton's doing to the Democratic race today, she has frozen it. So this idea that you know Hillary Clinton's going to be in a free fall when all these others get in against her, really what we're seeing today is it's unlikely they're all getting in against her if she decides to run. Now, you may have one or two candidates, but you're not going to have the big name candidates. You're not going to have Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren. Um, you know, so you have somebody, but it isn't going to be like a Barack Obama who, when he got into that race, there was a rock star feeling that this guy could take off, and he eventually did. But I think today, when people look at Hillary Clinton, they like her more today than they did in 08. And they like her because, one, she proved herself as Secretary of State, that she did a phenomenal job. But I really think what they like about her is she did something that they wish the partisans in Congress would do. She was able to put the politics that took place for a full two years behind her and said, I'm going to sign on and do something for the country. And that is exactly what the voters are craving. It goes back to what I said before. People are so frustrated that we have gridlock because people can't get beyond their politics. And Hillary Clinton has proven that even though it was the same party, and I give Barack Obama credit for bringing her on, that she could get beyond the politics and do the job that she wanted to do. And I believe that is one of the greatest strengths she brings, and that's why her numbers are where they are today. So I don't on think we're going to see the kind of race. I sense another response. Now, now Alex is going to get Elizabeth Warren into the race before the night is done. Where are <laughs> no, Hillary's numbers are insanely strong. And anyone who doesn't acknowledge that is living in a dream world. If uh, I would not bet my house against her being the nominee, I might bet Jim's house. <laughs> And the reason is this. She's got a very strong hand of cards, I think, for one more reason that we haven't mentioned, and that is America elected its first black president. America saw that as a step forward and seeing itself as a better nation that it always wants to be. Part of that, it, was, it made a choice. We're going to elect our first black president, not our first woman president. That, re that job remains undone. And I think that is a big driver uh, for Hillary Clinton's campaign for next election. It seems like something is still incomplete. That being said, the Democratic Party has moved left of Bill and Hillary Clinton. Barack Obama's Democratic Party is not the era of big government is over, Bill Clinton. It's the era of big government is back. The Democratic Party today is animated by a much more energized and left of Clinton uh, internet activism. I mean, to rally people on the internet, you don't go to the middle and say normal things. And that's true on both sides. So the Democratic Party is energized, in a, in, I think, to the left of Clinton. That kind of tension in politics at some point gives way. Three years, it's hard to believe that nobody in the Democratic Party is going to say, you know, I love Hillary Clinton and she's great, but the core of the Democratic Party is 
is a little bit to the left of her, so for her, for her own good, for the country's own good, for the party's own good, we're going to get out there and make sure we keep her honest and things start to bubble. And so I think she'll get a little bubbling. I would bet today she survives it. But you can see in these head-to-heads that it's still a tight general election, Hillary Clinton and anybody. What does that mean? What if those numbers collapse? Candidates today are like companies and brands. They don't wither away. You collapse in a day. Uh, we've certainly seen that. Speaking on the of Chris Christie, side. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. No, One more question. Like, if your business, I mean, we're all so connected that change doesn't happen slowly. It happens to all of us at once. Everything is, you know, uh, simultaneous in that way. So. Hillary Clinton would be my bet still to be the Democratic nominee, but I just, there's too much tension in there for something not to blow up. Itself. Now that there's, there's no tension at all in the Republican Party on the right. We, good <laughs> thing. I'm teasing you. But, uh, one, one more question, because I want to move on, because we're getting a little time. Uh, on the Democratic primary, I want to move on to the Republicans. Um, Steve, if she doesn't run, and you don't think she's going to run, who gets in this race, and does it involve someone you know well? Howard Dean, why wouldn't he run again? Um, <clears throat> well. <laughs> he has a 50-state strategy. He can name them. He's got a 50-state strategy, and he can name them, and he can name them in alphabetical in order. order if he needs to. <laughs> um, who, who benefits from Hillary if she doesn't run Hillary's exit? I actually think that, that in an odd way, Hillary and Joe Biden have exactly the same interest right now. And they'll have that same interest probably for another six, eight, ten months. Because Hillary can go give speeches for $200,000 a pop as long as she's not a candidate. But as long as she hasn't taken herself out, nobody else is going to get in. What Jim said is absolutely right. Hillary Clinton freezes the field. Nobody is going to be jumping in, <clears throat> excuse me, unless they're, they're um, semi-crazy and suicidal. Um, and, and certainly there's not going to be any significant fundraising that's going to occur for any other candidate as long as Hillary's sitting in the race. If you're Joe Biden, it's perfect because you don't want there to be a vacuum. You want Hillary to take all the oxygen. You don't want her to take herself out because then there's going to be a bunch of candidates. What you want is for her to continue making great speeches, making $200,000 a throw, thinking about it for as long as possible, and deciding as late as possible that she's out so that you can quickly consolidate all of the Obama, Clinton sort of machinery out there. And I do think that the Obama folks, who even the folks who prefer Hillary perhaps right now for, you know, because they think she's stronger or because they respect and admire what she did or for whatever reason, those people also have a very warm feeling and, and, and loyalty for Joe Biden. So I believe the Obama people would go in mass to Biden if Hillary weren't running. And I think you'd have a slightly different situation where you'd have not a 68% not a um, all but certain nominee if, if they were to run, but somebody who's pretty strong and would be pretty difficult to stop would be able to amass a fairly significant amount of resources pr fairly quickly. I don't think he is nearly as strong in a general election as Hillary is. Um, but I think he's an awfully smart guy, and he's a good campaigner. He connects with people, and if he runs a disciplined campaign, and he doesn't oh, make, hold on. and he doesn't Joe make, <laughs> and disciplined doesn't, and Joe okay. Biden do right. not belong okay. in the same sentence. Really. And doesn't make too many mistakes. You know, Dem I believe, and Alex has a, has a different view, but I think if you look at the map, unless something dramatic, dramatic changes, the Democrats start with 242 electoral votes, and they start with an advantage in many of the states that remain. So it's hard for any Republican to be successful. It's, it's especially hard if that Republican looks like a Tea Party kind of Republican. And um, I think Democrats just go into this thing with, a, with an advantage that Joe Biden would have. It wouldn't be as great as Hillary's, but he would have it. Another Democrat would have it. Howard tells me he's not going to run, and I believe that uh, he's not going to run. What's Mitt Romney doing in this, in this poll? Winning. Winning it. Yeah. <laughs> Just that. One way, the reason I wanted to see Mitt Romney in this survey is our field, as you can tell, is not as developed as the Democratic field. It is not as mature. 
Um, all our candidates have some question, flaw, challenge to overcome. <clears throat> um, a Bobby Jindal is, does he, okay, he's bright, great governor, does he have it? That charismatic thing. Uh, Jeb Bush, the Bush question. Marco Rubio, immigration, too young and inexperienced. Chris Christie, concerns. <clears throat> You know, all our candidates, my experience is campaigns don't pick candidates, they make candidates. As Steve was saying, these things are tough and it grinds them into dust, but if they survive and pick themselves up and move forward, they're better for it and they're better for us. The Republican field hasn't grown through that yet. So Mitt Romney right now is a parking lot in this survey. Voters are, are you saying a there. parking lot is a front runner in the... In the yeah. <laughs> Basically, he's none of the above. And voters are sitting there in this parking lot named Mitt Romney idling you know, in their cars it's until, Don't worry. <laughs> until one of these other Republican candidates grows, comes to life, has a moment, I paid for this microphone, matures, and somebody catches on. Shut so he's, down that bridge. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't do that. OK, but so that, that's what Mitt Romney's, I think, telling us. I don't think he is telling us that Mitt Romney is the Republican front runner. The Republican Party has about burned itself to the ground, <coughs> losing elections we should have won because we only know how to say no instead of thinking our principles and ideas are for actually anything better. The Republican Party, I think, understands that, and it's not looking to turn back. It knows it needs to move ahead. So that's, I think, a, a way to look at the that sheet music up there. Can I cause a little trouble here? Please, no. You've been doing it all day. Why not? So, <laughs> so it, you know, we're in New Hampshire. We're at the Institute of Politics. So everybody here is really, really well versed in politics and political campaigns, and everybody here knows politicians well, right? So let's just talk about the, the psyche of a politician who's wanted to be president for a really long time. You, you, know, you know the person. You see them. They come to your house. They go dancing with you. They take you to dinner. You know these people, right? <laughs> Mitt Romney is one of those people. A friend of mine used to joke that, that wanting to be president is like a disease. And the only cure for the disease is death. <laughs> Anybody who's ever wanted to be president always wants to be president. And so what's Mitt Romney doing in the poll is a question that you can ask Alex, and Alex will give you a parking lot answer. But the question is, what happens when a politician sees their name in a poll and sees that they're the front runner in New Hampshire? Somebody who's wanted to be president for a really long time. Somebody who looks at this field and with all due respect says, oh my god, why would I respect this field? Somebody who's, who's gone through it, who ran against a juggernaut, who, who competed against the most effective the most technologically sophisticated, the most well-funded campaign in the history of the world, and ran a pretty good race and came relatively close. Why would that guy not look at this poll and say, I'm the front runner. I could win in New Hampshire. The calendar's going to be compressed. I've just got to win two or three primaries, and I'm on a roll. I'll get nominated. And then any Republican right now is in a two-point race with Hillary Clinton in a purple state. He's got as good a chance of being president as the Republican nominee as anybody in that field, and I would argue better than anybody in that field. So just Mitt Romney says he's not going to run. I don't have any reason to doubt his sincerity or his word. But I can tell you this. I'll bet you the people around Mitt Romney who are closest to him are looking at this thing today saying, hey, Mitt, did you see that poll in New Hampshire? I know, I, I know the reporters in the, in the political community have, are tweeting it around. It's gotten a lot of pickup. So there's going to be some conversation, I think, in the coming days. And maybe the, the conversation will be about the parking lot. Plus, he, gets, the a, he gets another big house, which would be. <laughs> and, and, you know, if the first contribution to draft Mitt Romney for president comes from Steve He's McMahon, <laughs> have doubts. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they do come here, and they dance with us, and they mow our lawns. And New Hampshire's very spoiled. but. <laughs> I have to tell you, too, that I mentioned that I think people like Hillary Clinton more now. I think they like Mitt Romney more now that the campaign is over. And if any of you have seen the Mitt movie that's out, you will come away, I think, with a different impression of Mitt Romney, particularly the scenes when the handlers aren't there. Um, for me, what stands out is election night, because 
he's in a hotel room. If you, I don't know if you've seen it, but he's in a hotel room. The Florida results come in, and he turns to his staff and he says, "I think it's time to start writing a concession speech." He doesn't start crying. He's not angry. He's a class act, um, and. I kept thinking when I saw that, boy, that's not the Mitt Romney we saw during the campaign. And how many times have we seen this? I kept thinking, they didn't write a concession speech? <laughs> but but he, you know, he wasn't weepy. He was accepting what happened and doing it in a really classy way. And since then, we've seen him on the comedy shows, and we've seen a whole different Mitt. And I thought, I saw this with other candidates. That Al Gore was a better candidate once the handlers went away. Mitt Romney is a better candidate when people can see the real Mitt Romney. And so I do think the <laughs> poll reflects people have good feelings toward him as a person. And I agree with Steve. I don't have the bumper sticker. Are you going to contribute? Yes, you do. Are you going to contribute to but, the draft? But round? I do think you know if you have makers. if you have committed your life to being president, and all of a sudden you're not running against anybody. It's an open seat which motivates a lot more people to want to run. All right, wait, wait, Jim. I, this may on, be something I, that he has to give a look to. All right, so here's the way this all works. This is how people <laughs> works. A few weeks ago on CNN, my partner here, more than a few weeks ago, a month or so ago, Alex floated his idea that in primaries, with lots of people who'd love to be president, and all believe they can, uh, the parties are going to have an ideological discussion. He just talked about that. Which Democratic Party emerges? And which female, because we, we've talked about that too. Probably something this country feels is important. Certainly women in this country feel it's very important, uh, and many men. So now we question, OK, well, who might be the person to take on Hillary Clinton? Sarah Palin. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the, and the answer Alex came up with is, well, Elizabeth Warren is much more like, I can only say it like Alex, Elizabeth Warren is much more like Barack Obama than Hillary Clinton is. And it's true. She represents the Obama wing of the Democratic Party. She also happens to be a woman. She is well regarded, and she is new and fresh, very different than Hillary. So we started this little thing, and he tweeted it, and I tweeted it. We started writing columns and blogs about this and speaking up. Yeah, Elizabeth Warren, she may be the one to keep Hillary honest, you know. Now, these two. <laughs> have started the draft Mitt Romney movement today. And they've He's done the very front well. runner in New Hampshire. <laughs> anyway, I think, listen, all of you understand the way this works. There is no way that this poll is truly reflective of where we will be on election days, where we are now. Why is Mitt Romney there? Two factors. The Joni Mitchell factor, don't know what you got till it's gone. And when you know Mitt Romney and you work for Mitt Romney, and we did, uh, you understand that he's a terrific guy. You can agree or disagree with him, but he's a terrific human being. And at the end of the day, the Mitt you see in the movie Mitt is pretty much who the guy is. So there's a little reinventionism of the, of the Romney brand afterwards, but at the end of the day, Mitt Romney's not running for president, I don't believe. And I guess I'd have to admit that at least if I'm to trust what Elizabeth Warren said, and I do, that she's probably not running. But somebody will, because these numbers are too tempting for too many politicians to look at New Hampshire, Iowa, South Carolina, and everything that lies after it, and not at least begin to think, what about me? I just want to say real quickly that if we do look at these numbers, and if I'm Nikki Haley, a Republican governor of South Carolina, I'd roll the dice. I think that something like that is more likely to happen. And the other thing I'll say is I haven't seen the Mitt movie yet. I hear it has the same unhappy ending. <laughs> it's like, I was hoping that in the movie they'd come up with something better. It's but, like Titanic. The ship still like sinks. It still sinks. <laughs> yeah. Republicans can't even get fiction better. That's, actually, we have to pimp this movie because Alex is in it. He hasn't seen it yet. He's in the first scene. So we're getting, he's getting residuals every time someone watches it. So please look for Alex. The and about, they said the best part's when the operators were out of the room, right? As you just <laughs> said. Oh, it's just teasing. Um, so, uh, Pat, yeah, Scott Brown, A, running for Senate, B, running for president, C, fooled you, not doing anything. Uh, D, yeah. running for vice president. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I think, here's what I think has happened with Scott Brown. Uh, I think Scott Brown toyed with this idea and, and, and toyed with the idea in a media market that is pretty much the same as Boston. Southern New Hampshire is northern Massachusetts. The Globe still has very significant uh, penetration here. The Boston television market is significant here. Uh, 
Uh, at the end of the day, Scott Brown uh, has, has played his brand a bit on Twitter, on social media. He's teased, as I said this morning, the last person to do this erotic a strip tease for voters was Gypsy Rose Lee. And the bottom line is, what happened? Suddenly, Scott Brown has found himself in a place where a popular three-term governor and senator is tied with a guy who's not running. Now, if you're the Republican Party, and you're any of the candidates who've declared they're running, and you're frozen in place, to use the term we've used about Hillary, how do you start to feel? And by the way, when this poll was tweeted out this morning, Jeannie Shaheen had a fundraising letter out by 10 AM. She will raise at least $200,000, $250,000 by the fact that polling and the Globe story indicate that Senator Brown might be in this. Now we hear he might run for president. He's humbled by that, by the way. I read that in another tweet from your poll earlier. Scott Brown has put himself in a place right now where the money in the party starts to say, what are we doing here? And where the voters in the party start to say, are you going to do this or are you not? I think he's gotten himself to a point where it's going to be hard to pull back. Kenny, he can do anything he wants to. He keeps his Fox deal. He keeps a, a, a couple of good deals on boards. He's got a career. He may choose to do that. But in politics, timing is everything. You are relevant when you're relevant, and you cannot rely on the fact that you might be relevant two or four years from now. Uh, there's a big, fat, slow pitch, it appears, coming over the plate. If you watch it go by, it may not ever come again. Jim, Jean Shaheen calls you up, she does all the time, and she says, I think she called this morning, didn't she? I, I got her email. <laughs> <laughs> she says, um, you know, look, I, I'm going to prepare myself because I need to be prepared in case he gets in. But what am I, is he, is this real? What do you say that? Uh, well, I'm not convinced it is real. I, I do think if you look at how the whole Scott Brown thing started, um, it really was a guy coming to New Hampshire and Iowa, which would lead you to believe he was hoping to get his name in the mix in the presidential talk. Um, and then the more he came and the more desperate the re state Republican Party became to get a candidate, um, the talk started to shift to that. I don't think it was ever his plan, and I'm just speculating, that he'd be running for the U.S. Senate in New Hampshire. There, there's a big, big if here, and that is it's hard to run for Senate in a state that you've been living in for three weeks. That is something that a lot of people are going to be scratching their heads at. Enough that, about Hillary. We've talked I was just going to say, Hillary. unless you're moving to New York. <laughs> right. so, but I do think that um, he does have to make a decision on what he wants to do and where he wants to be not only in this race, but after this race. And if he runs and loses, you can be sure that if he really did have higher aspirations, they're gone. If he really likes his Fox gig, it's over. He might as well keep the truck going to Maine and get ready for the Senate race two years down the road there. Because he's in trouble because he's, he's ended his career with a defeat in New Hampshire. And I, I, I'm not convinced that it's his desire to run for the U.S. Senate again. I think if you look how this all started with the many trips to New Hampshire and the many trips to Iowa, that wasn't a signal that this guy is getting ready to run for the U.S. Senate. So I'm not totally convinced that when the decision comes down, it's going to be the Senate. But if you saw the Globe today, you also saw the Republican Party in New Hampshire is getting very anxious that he's got to make a decision or they've got to go start searching for someone else again. So um, I would think that the pressure is on for him to make a decision soon. I wouldn't bet my house on it that he's getting into the race, but I would bet Alex's house <laughs> on it <laughs> that he might not get into the race. Can I just add one quick thing, and that is voters think elections aren't about candidates. They think elections are about them. And those people in that survey that said they'd vote for Scott Brown, they're asking him to. This thing has, wasn't real perhaps to start with, but it's become real enough now that either he runs or basically he's telling voters that when he could run, has a chance to win, he's not going to stand up and fight for them. Are you talking about Mitt Romney now or Scott <laughs> Brown? Well, aren't they both running? <laughs> it's based on what you guys. Okay, I think this, that's, I mean, a, that's a tough message 
And the candidates I've seen who never do well in life are the ones who avoid losing by not running. <laughs> yeah, it seems have... to be a very popular Republican strategy. Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> I want to open this up for questions. So I think we have microphones. Just raise your hand. We can hook you up with one. Uh, one last question here to, to Steve, though. You know, it's not been so much about the candidates, these campaigns, and it hasn't even been about the people. It's really been about the national mood in New Hampshire in the last few cycles, swinging back and forth. Uh, when you're Scott Brown looking at this race, or just overall, what do you see as a national mood? Is this a swing year, or is this a more muddled midterm? Well, I, I think if, you're, if you are the candidate of change, if you're the outsider, that uh, against an incumbent, even a popular, well-regarded incumbent like Gene Shaheen, that you have certain advantages in a, at, at, a, at a time like this. I think what Scott Brown will discover quickly, though, is instead of being the candidate of change, he'll be the candidate of change of address. Um, <laughs> and he'll be the guy who actually is the worst kind of political sh chameleon because he lives in Massachusetts, he runs in Massachusetts, he wins in Massachusetts, and then he gets beaten in Massachusetts, and he picks up his cards in his house and his truck, truck. Yeah. and he comes to New Hampshire and starts looking for a house and a house seat or a Senate seat <laughs> to run in. You know, the, the, the high mark for his campaign is probably right now, because he's not in it. He's, he's, he's relatively unknown. He's relatively unscathed. There hasn't really been, I and mean, there's been $100,000 worth of negative ads, but not anything like what he would see if he were a real live candidate. And, you know, challengers like this are sometimes enticed into a race and then pounded into submission by a disciplined, effective campaign on the other side. I'm not sure Scott Brown has, a, other than himself and his truck, I don't know what his campaign would consist of if he got in tomorrow. But I do know that if he got in tomorrow, he would get, he would get obliterated by the third party groups that would come in and try to do to him what's been done to Shaheen. She's probably sitting right now right at what the Democratic base vote is. I don't think you're going to be able to push Jean Shaheen down much further than where she is right now. Um, and she hasn't started a campaign yet. She's basically hoarding her money and she's waiting to see who her, who her opponent is. And when there is an opponent, when it's clear, she'll be well funded and she'll um, have plenty of help. And, you know, the, the, the game will be on then. Um, it hasn't begun yet. It looks pretty good right now for the guy standing on the sideline. Um, after other people have thrown a million and a half dollars at Gene Shaheen. But at some point he's going to have to stand on his own two feet, stand in the ring if he wants this, take a punch, and not just let somebody else throw a chair from the back of the bar, which is what's going on right now. We'll open up for questions. We're only going to do a few because I want to get you out on time. And we're already running a little late. And you late. want to get to the Indiana game, don't you? <laughs> well, you know, it's hard to do it, to be honest. Um, so again, a question just... Uh, we're, we're, so, uh, hold, raise, raise your hand and we'll give a mic to you. Should be. Oh, go ahead and I can just repeat it. Okay. Um, oh, we can hear you. We can hear you. Sure. Uh, are any of you as worried as I am about the um, the money, outside money, on all of these elections? And are, are both sides fairly equal in that? Or is one side much, 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 much more endowed? <laughs> well. Don't, don't Alex, say that. Just, <laughs> just, just, just be quiet. Let somebody aside. else take that one, okay? Leaving aside the question of who that was an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, war um, on women. So yes, I'm one. I think a lot of people in this country are concerned with the amount of money that's spent in campaigns today. But let's talk about the million and a half that's been spent in New Hampshire because that's come from one group, and that's Americans for Prosperity, and that is a lot of money, uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. That you know the Koch brothers who are well known for the money they invest in campaigns is going to flow into the state for quite some time. Now, six years ago, that didn't happen here because there was a court decision that struck down the caps on that kind of spending. So what we're seeing today is unprecedented expenditures from one individual. That, I think, is concerning. And um, 
you know, I don't know how you change it because the law was struck down, but it has a significant impact. Now, Steve made a point, though, that there are, on the Democratic side, third-party groups, too, that are going to spend unlimited amounts. So this Senate race that we see, if it shapes up, and it is Gene Shaheen and Scott Brown, will probably be the most expensive race we've ever seen in the state's history. I would not be surprised to see each side spend anywhere from 15 to 20 million dollars um, when you add it all together. Now, that 40 million dollars combined for a U.S. Senate race in a state of a million three is a lot of money and can have a huge effect. And the worst part is, unlike the candidates, and I'm going to put the blame on both sides here, these third-party ads are as hard-hitting as you can get. I mean, they not only do they drive, you know, voters in a certain direction, they drive people, a lot of people, out of voting as well because they get so turned off to how negative campaigning can be. And, and this is on both sides of the aisle. But, you know, when you turn on your TV set now and you see that ad that's been playing on Boston TV, cable TV, <coughs> Channel 9, um, it starts to wear you down after a while. So I think everybody should be concerned that we're about, we could possibly see, you know, a 40 or $50 million Senate race in New Hampshire. That, that is concerning. And that's a, that's a bargain, by the way. Yeah, if that is. Scott Brown raised and spent 60 some odd million dollars in Massachusetts. If you look at the kind of money that'll come in here, and Jim's right, it's not just the Koch brothers, and it's not just Americans for Prosperity, it's not just conservative groups, uh, trial lawyers and, and, and liberal groups and moveon.org, all of those folks from both sides play. And in a state like New Hampshire, where we're pretty good at sizing up even the most important vice presidents and presidents who stand for re-election and senators who have to come here and go through this retail politic thing, uh, that's troubling because we'd like to think that we have some control over this. I've done a lot of campaigns in this state and I will tell you this, uh, it's better to have money than not. but. It is still very, very difficult. It's not impossible. Still very, very difficult, at least in this state, to buy a campaign. Let's put it this way. Both sides are going to have plenty of money in a Shaheen-Brown matchup, and not all of it, not even most of it, will be theirs. Can I offer a different point of view? I don't think there's enough money in politics. Oh. <laughs> How much did the United States, States spend last year on Halloween? Candy and decorations. Eight billion dollars. We spend more on hair color than we do picking our leaders. And generally, when people don't throw money away, people do it because it seems to work, both sides. I'd submit to you that they're spending it on you. First of all, New Hampshire does real well. This is like Disneyland in New Hampshire. It's the official <laughs> state business. <clears throat> Secondly, there's nutritional value in at the end of the day, the jury gets to hear arguments from both sides. And you're the jury. And you're sitting here right now saying, you know, they're spending all this money. And he's telling you it's from the Koch brothers. You're informed. But you're not informed who's spending the money. So maybe the answer is not to worry so much about the money as to worry about the transparency and the openness. And we have the capacity today to be informed instantly of money that's spent in campaigns. Where it came from? Why aren't we? That might be a better solution. Informing, you know, at the end of the day, an old top-down solution that's going to squeeze the balloon over here when we know what will happen to the balloon over there, it's not going to work. But informing everybody here, I'd rather trust you guys than somebody to fix it like they fixed it last time or whatever. Another question? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I have a, maybe a question comment. I think it's interesting that you think that uh, Scott Brown didn't have support out of New Hampshire for his run in Massachusetts because I know that mm -hmm. there was a lot of money that came out of this state that went down to help him. There was a lot of people who went down there to work the polls. Um, so if you think that he doesn't have a chance in this state, I think that 
you're fooling yourself because I think that there was a lot of support for him. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I, I think that there was people that from New Hampshire who helped fund his campaign and went down to support him. Just like every election, we have a lot of people from Massachusetts, a lot of college students especially, who come to New Hampshire to lend a hand. But I don't think that transforms into the average New Hampshire vote. I think a lot of people here are going to be troubled with the idea that this is a person who was the U.S. Senator next door, lost that seat, and now he's coming to New Hampshire to run for a seat here. And here's where I think he's going to, what's going to haunt him. Several years ago, there was another Massachusetts <laughs> politician who moved to New Hampshire and actually lived here longer, but was hammered by a lot of the Republican leaders on being a carpetbagger, Chubb Peabody. And there will be a day, I think, when somebody will say to Scott Brown, some of these names, and they'll read the quotes from back then, who have encouraged you to run here, here's what they said, what was that, 15 years ago? Maybe more than that, uh, when Chubb Peabody ran. And then, I don't know how he responds to that, when there's some of the very people who had a problem then, but don't have a problem today, with someone from Massachusetts but, running but, here. But here's the thing, and I, you ask a, a good question. And I, Listen, the, these guys make a good point. What you're hearing over here is a terrible, terrible fear that Scott Brown gets into this race. Why? Because he's a game changer. Scott Brown is from Massachusetts. We all know that. He was in the Senate in Massachusetts. We all know that. He lost. He's had a home in New Hampshire for 30-something years. His mother and sister live here. This is not a new thing for Scott Brown. He's been very transparent about it. He lived in uh, Rentham, Wenham, where did he live? Rentham. Rentham. He had a home in Rye. He and his wife and family have, he, he grew up here summers and has spent a lot of time here. So the, the pure carpetbagger thing is, is, a, is a little silly. Hillary can go to New York and run for president. It's not a big issue. I think the big problem here though is these guys do make a good point. I think Alex and I have admitted you know, when you look at that list of Republican candidates, when you're a Republican, whew, we got a lot of work to do. One thing about Scott Brown is he is going to change the fundamental race here. This race was not supposed to be in play. Senator Sheen was a safe senator long before anyone ever looked at this before health care launched. This, this is, a, this is a, a, a terrible, terrible attempt by lots of folks who don't want to see Scott Brown in this race because they know he changes the game. Why? He doesn't fight a lot of the battles that some Republicans do, some who are already in this race, in terms of a general election candidate. And that, for Senator Shaheen, is a real challenge. So, you know, with all due respect to my colleagues here, and, and, and they, they're right about a lot of things, uh, but not everything. And one of the things <laughs> is that the bottom line, Jean Shaheen is terrified of Scott Brown, and she should be. She should be. This will be an interesting race. And it could change not just the outcome of the Senate race in New Hampshire. It could change the entire uh, structure of the United States Senate and could tip the balance back to Republicans. By the way, what's your favorite football team around here? St. A's. <laughs> no, 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 that's a good question. <laughs> Is what? it? You don't root for those guys who used to be the Boston Patriots, right? They're, oh, they're the New England Patriots now. You're also in a unique part of the country. You're in a region here. And I mean, there are a lot, there's a lot of commuting and there's a lot going on here. You have a regional identity as well as a state. Somebody who's got roots here, I'm not sure how the carpetbagger argument, you know, there, there are other places that it's been, I think it would be easier to make that. Does anyone have a burning question? Because I want to be fair to you. <laughs> Yes. Uh oh, Very this good. is going to be a hard one. Oh, well, we, you can't ask it. What is this your place? <laughs> so this is for Patrick and Alex. In your list of, of Republican candidates, I used to live in Wisconsin. So there were two names. Thank you for bringing this up. Noticeably absent, Ryan and Walker. Yeah. And I'd like to get your opinion on both of those names. I'll, I'll uh, <clears throat> in my guess, perhaps an you know, somewhat educated guess, I think Paul Ryan understands how unique he is. He's a Republican with a calculator. He actually can add the numbers. He knows where the money is. He's vital to our party. 
And I think he, uh, he wants to and understands how important it is for him to be head of Ways and Means. And perhaps he sees himself down the road as a presidential candidate. <coughs> I'm not sure he sees himself as that at this moment. But that doesn't mean he wouldn't take a look at it again in 2014. Scott Walker, if I had to buy a Republican stock now at a cheap price, it might be Scott Walker's. Why? Because he's got the largest database of, of support, social media support, because he went through those recalls. Recall of any Republican and, in fact, any politician next to Barack Obama in this country because he has raised money nationally for those and knows how to do it because he's actually done a good job as governor and made that state, brought that state back from an economic precipice and made it work. He's got a story to tell. And lastly, because he is maybe a little charismatically impaired <laughs> And that's actually a plus, because you've seen how these primaries work for Republicans. Anybody who sticks their head out of the foxhole gets it shot off. And they all line up one after another, and they get devoured by this process. He may be the last guy. He may draw the luckiest card. I think he is a serious contender. <clears throat> and if he wins re-election, it'll be the third time winning statewide in a Democratic state. Thanks. Because the recall, right? Yeah. That's right, three times. Yeah. I, one quick thing. Uh, Walker and uh, Ryan, if they got these polls in their inbox this morning and some other polls and they looked at the challenges Republicans face, you can be sure there's formative time for these field, this field to still settle. Um, we have to look at who's running now. And again, you can't look at everybody, as Doug said, we're going to look again. But my sense is we're going to start to see some alternatives. Candidates you see tonight might not be in this race in a few weeks. Candidates that weren't on our radar screen tonight might appear suddenly. So, Like Mitt. Like Mitt. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and like Elizabeth. He's gone into the movie business. Okay? <laughs> That's right. Well, he's got a buddy like Clint Eastwood, so why not, right? That's right. Um, anyway, thank you so much, everybody. And thank uh, you. thanks for showing up. Thank you, James. Thank you, everybody. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.